today, I want to talk to those of you that have genuine, real questions about faith. And and today, I want to start off with a a bit of an apology on behalf of the church. The, The truth is, historically and far too often, even experientially, for many of you, the church and your church experience has not been a safe place to ask questions. Far too often you've heard things like, well, the Bible says so, so just do it. Don't ask questions. Just have more faith. Don't have doubts. Don't wrestle. Don't research. Just do it. And if you've had that experience in any church at any point, on behalf of the church, I just want to say I'm sorry. Because the church should be a safe place the safest of places to ask questions, to have doubts, to wrestle. And today we are starting a brand new series and looking at some questions that the church should give an answer to. Over the next few weeks, we'll talk about a lot of things. We'll talk about things like hell. Is it, is it real? Is it not real? We'll talk about evil and suffering. We'll talk about feeling abandoned by God. We'll talk about hypocrisy in the church and church hurt. We'll talk about a lot of things that really aren't discussed in church or thoroughly explained in church. And here's our heart. A lot of times these things can kind of be one-sided. It can kind of feel like a a monologue and not so much like a, a dialogue or a conversation. And I get it. To some degree, I get it, because we have a limited amount of space and time in this kind of event. And so what we want to do is we want to provide you an opportunity to invite you into the conversation to ask your questions. And you can do this in two ways. We'll put a slide on the screen behind me. The first way that you can do this is you can just simply text us your questions, your real, genuine faith questions. So I would encourage you to pull out your phone, maybe take a picture of that slide, or maybe just put it into your phone. So number one is you can text us your questions at any point during this message, any message, or any message that we ever do, and ask your questions. The second way is if you're in the room, right, you can actually just fill out one of our connect cards, and you can turn it into the info table in the back. And so we want to just say that questions are okay. Your questions are valid, whatever they are. And we want to help answer those questions. And the way that we're going to answer those questions may look like a lot of different things. We may answer them on a Sunday. We may answer them in this series. Over the next few weeks together in the fall, we may answer your questions from the stage. We may just text respond like, hey, let's get coffee. That's kind of a little bit longer conversation. Let's sit down and go through that question together. Um, Or we may even put it out online. Maybe it's a question that many people are dealing with. And uh, we want to put that out publicly online in some kind of format. So uh, we do want to encourage you to and invite you to ask your questions. Now today, uh, we are looking at the topic of sin. Today is going to be a doozy. And the question is, God, why is sin such a big deal? And maybe you've wondered that too. God, why is sin such a big deal? And to answer this question, we'll be in Romans chapter 5. And just from the outset, as we answer these questions, I want you to know that my goal is not to give you my opinion. My goal is to give you the word of God. Uh, It was funny to me this uh, past week. So uh, as many of you know, my kids were in homeschooled, and this was the first year that we put them into kind of public school, and it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a Christian school. And so one of the things that they have there is something called chapel. And, um, and so we got, the parents got invited to go to chapel this week. And, uh, and it was fun. Like me and my wife, we show up, and uh, there's like, I don't know, like 150 kindergartners through second graders. It was crazy. And as you can imagine, all the energy that's in the room. And, uh, and at one point, there was a guest speaker, and uh, he read a verse from the Bible, And uh, he was a really animated guy. He goes, he's like, all right, kids, listen, listen, pay attention. Who's talking here? He just read the Bible. 
who's talking here? Who is talking to you? He just kept saying, who's speaking here? And uh, some of the kids on you know, one side of the room were like, God, God speaking, God speaking. And then this one little kid in the middle of the back road like, just stood up. And he said, nah. He said, you are. You've got the mic. And, and I, it just made me laugh. And the, the reality is today, like, yes, I, I do have the mic. But I want you to know that my aim is to go straight to, to God's word. And so, if you have a Bible, we'll pick it up in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Why is sin such a big deal? And it says this in verse 12. It says, therefore, now we've got to stop. Let's talk. Let's talk. That didn't take very long. Uh, anytime that you read in the Bible, you read the word therefore, you need to back up and see what the therefore is therefore. Right? So if you, if you write in your Bible, circle, highlight, underline the word therefore, and then draw an arrow up to verse 8. So if you back up to verse 8, you see what the therefore is all about. So Paul says this in verse 8. He says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, there's our word, Christ died for us. Now, this is very, very, very important. How do I know God loves me? When I look at the circumstances of my life, how do I know God loves me? How in the world can I have cancer and know God loves me? How can she be leaving me again and know that God, when the circumstances around me are not going how I think they should go, how do I know he loves me? And Paul says God has demonstrated, he has shown us his love in this, that even while we were in our sin, while we were enemies of God, before you ever did anything good, before you ever read a Bible, before you ever came to a church service, before you did anything at all, I've got good news that God has demonstrated his love for you in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we did anything good. This means that that God is not in love with some future version of you. And he's just waiting on you to get your act together and catch up. No, 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 no. If you want proof that God loves you, just, just look. He, don't look at your circumstances, man, because you, you'll be all over the place. You look at the cross. That's what he's saying. Now, we'll talk more about that later in the series. Why Jesus? Why does Jesus matter? But here Paul keeps going and he says this in verse 9. He says, since therefore we have now been justified. Justified is a, a legal term. Ju justified means that our record would say that we're guilty. But the judge looks at us and says, not guilty. That's, that's what justified means. Just if I had no sin. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. That's the cross. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, when we were reconciled to God by death through the Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So here's why the therefore is in verse 12. It is there to remind us that God sent Jesus to reconcile us unto himself. That we were enemies of God and Christ came into the world on a rescue mission to bring us back to God because that's what sin does. It separates us from God. And this goes all the way back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit said, let us make mankind in our own image. And so he made them male and female. He made them. He created them. And then the Bible says that he gathers the, the dust of the earth and he makes Adam. In Hebrew, the word is Adam. It means dirt. And so there is this shell of a human being just there. He's not yet a living creature. And then God breathes. He breathes the breath of life into his nostrils. And the Bible wants you to know that, that God was face to face with his creation. And so the very first thing that the very first human sees is God. Face to face. And every single one of us, regardless of what you believe, that's what you were created for. That's what you were created for. That's why you got this thing inside of you that is never satisfied. That's why when you lay your head on a pillow at night, even on your best of days, and you think, 
is this it? Is this really all there is? No, no, this ain't it. Like, this is not it. You were created for a face-to-face -face relationship with your creator. So that's Genesis 1 and 2. And then in Genesis 3, Adam sins. And that relationship is fractured. It is broken. And now you and I are far distant from God. And Jesus comes to make that thing whole again. Now that's the big picture. That's the, the backdrop for what Paul is about to say. And here... Paul is about to, for the rest of this chapter, just kind of lay out why sin is such a big deal and why we need Jesus to rescue us. And here, Paul wants us to know at least four things about sin. And here's the first thing he says, maybe the most offensive. Paul says, first and foremost, you need to know that you are a born sinner. You are a born sinner. He says in verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. And how do we know this? Because all sin. Paul wants us to know that everyone is a born sinner. Now, you can think about the sweetest person you know. Who is that? Grandma, right? Sinner. Now listen, I, I know that this is offensive in our culture. Because there's a lot of people who'd say, like, come on, how dare you? Like, who do you think you are to say that I'm a sinner? And look, I get it. But I'm, I'm like the, the mailman, right? I didn't write the mail, I just deliver it. And the reality is, it's, it's far worse than, than you can even imagine. Like, that, that defensiveness that would rise up inside of you, like, that says, nah, -uh, like, no way, not me, that's called pride. And that's like the, the Super Bowl of all sin. Like, football's back, can you tell? Right? So, this is how we were born. But the thing is, when we think about sin, we, we tend to think about the activity of it. The activity, the actions, the, the surface, not the, the soil, not the, the root of it. The problem is not that you sin. Let me just say that again. The problem is not that you sin. The problem is that you and I are a sinner. That's what we are. See, we tend to think of sin as an issue or a struggle or a mistake, but sin is not a thing that we do. Sin is not just something that we do or have done. It's not just a mistake that we've made. There's more gravity to it than that. The problem is not that we sin. The problem is deep in here. It's deep in here. Uh, for example, some examples that I thought about. Lying. Listen to this. It's not just that I told a lie. That, that is a sin. But the deeper problem is that what is wrong with me? That in that moment, I bend the truth or just flat out lie because I am more concerned about what you think about me than I'm concerned with the truth. What is wrong with me that I, I seek your applause instead of the applause of heaven? What is wrong with That's the root of sin. Or what about slander and gossip? It, it's not just slander or gossip. But what is wrong with me that I can intentionally mistreat someone and just drag their name through the mud just to get the the four people in the cubicle next to me to like me, and the truth is, I really don't even like them. What is wrong with me that I just want to get a laugh out of them at the expense of someone else? What is wrong with me? I'll tell you the problem. The problem is me. I'm a black-hearted glory thief, and so are you. That at the expense of everybody else, we will want to make much of ourselves. That we want to be the center of our own universe. And I'll do whatever I can for my own good and my own glory. You see, sin, sin is not just a state of doing, friends. Sin is a state of being. It is coded in our DNA. It is alive. It is aggressive. It is deceptive. It is impossible to cure on our, with our own efforts. In a very practical sense, it's a deep rejection of God's ultimate good and his glorious rule and reign in our life. 
Now, I love how Dr. John Piper says this. Uh, here's what sin is. Sin is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not revered, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the promises of God not believed, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, and the person of God not loved, and the gospel of God not believed. You see, sin is a really, really big deal. And we were born sinners. And the moment that, that you realize that, then you are at the beginning of being ready to do what you need to do, which is to cry out to help to Jesus. Because you can't really fix yourself. You can't do this. Now, a good question to ask here is like, how did this happen? Like, how did we get here? Maybe you've wondered that. Like, how in the world did I get roped into all of this? Well, Paul tells us in verse 12. He says, just as sin came into the world, and how did it come into the world? Just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam. And what did Adam do? Adam, the first human created, chose to defy God's authority and to reject his clear command. It wasn't vague. It was a clear command to not eat from the, the tree of knowledge and evil. And because of that choice, Paul says, death has descended on or spread to all people. Uh, even though we weren't physically present with Adam, God regards Adam's choice to be ours. We are guilty in Adam. So maybe you've heard of being uh, uh, guilty by association. Ever heard of that? Here, this is guilty by representation. This is called the, the doctrine of the original sin. And it simply means that Adam's sin was our sin. Adam's choice was our choice. I mean, notice uh, the end of verse 12. It says, because we all sinned. In other words, we all sinned in him. In Adam we sinned. And at this point, I hope you're saying this because I'm saying this. How the heck is that fair? How, is that, how can I be held responsible for something I had no part in? Like, I wasn't consulted uh, there wasn't a little committee to talk about this. Uh, I didn't get a vote. Like, how the heck is this fair? I mean, to be candid with you, man, I've struggled with this. And maybe you, you have too. I mean, think about it. The, the effects of this choice were not insignificant. Be because of this cho choice, death has descended upon all of us. Y'all, this means that every disease, every natural disaster, every painful struggle with cancer, every child born with a birth defect, every divorce, every rape, every war, every case of abuse, even hell itself goes back to this one choice. And I wasn't there for it. So how is this fair? Well, in, in calling Adam our representative, God is saying he knew that Adam what, what Adam chose is what we would each choose had we be given, given the same choice. I mean, keep in mind, God was not just some passive observer. God is the infinitely wise creator. He understands literally everything about us. And God knew that how Adam acted is how you would have acted. So we cannot say, no, no, no. You know, had I been there, I would have made the right choice. Had I been there, God would be really pleased with me. No, because that's saying that we know more than God. God who knows all and is infinitely just knew everything. He knew given that the same temptation that Adam was given, that every, every one of us would have took it. And that's not even hard for us to, to grasp, right? I mean, think about it. You, you can't even keep Oreos in your house without being tempted. Right? Anybody? Right? And yet you think that you could resist the temptation to eat from a tree promising God-like power and knowledge. You say, but still, I didn't make that choice. 
So it doesn't seem to be fair to me to be held accountable for something I didn't choose. Okay. But haven't you made that same choice at some point in your life already? Ha- haven't you adopted Adam's line of thinking before? I-, I know better than God. I would rather do what I want than what God wants me to do. How many times in your life have you ado- adopted this thinking? How many times in your life have you adopted this thinking this week? How many times in your life have you known the right thing to do but did the opposite? You and I have ratified Adam's choice a thousand times over. There's a a story about St. Augustine that he tells um, 1,500 years ago. Um, If you know about Augustine, Augustine wasn't raised as a Christian, uh, and he ran with kind of a pretty sketchy group of guys um, as a teenager. Uh, and he says, uh, one night uh, after, you know, they were, you know, playing in the streets, playing sports, uh, and they were heading home in his neighborhood, uh, he looked over and noticed that there was a, a tree with a bunch of pears on it, and uh, it was on someone else's property, and so uh, him and his buddies, they, they just jump the wall, like grab all the pears, and they, you know, take off, so they steal all the pears. And, and here's the thing that uh, Augustine said about Uh, these pears. He said the pears didn't even look that good, and none of us was hungry, and we ended up just giving them to the hogs. But he says this, he says, what haunted me was why I stole those pears. Here's what he said. He said, it was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. I loved my error, not that for which I erred, but for the error itself. Augustine said, I delighted in doing the forbidden. I delighted in doing the the wrong. And he he explains that in all of our lives, we can look back and see at some point where we have chose wrong just simply because it was wrong. Because we have an inward pull. We have an inward attraction to it. And the same is true for us. We have all nursed a secret resentment to the God of the universe and his authority. Even though we weren't physically present with Adam we, when he sinned, we've all ratified that choice. I, I think all those things are being implied here in verse 12 when it says, because all have sinned. Th- this means that we all sinned in Adam because God regarded him as our representative. So what is, why sin a big deal? Paul wants us to know first and foremost that this is something that we were born with. It's in our blood. The second thing that Paul wants us to know is that sin leads to death. Sin is, is it's like a disease that leads to certain death. Look, look back at verse 12. Notice the language. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Now, do, do I really have to explain the, the spreading of a disease? that leads to death. And certainly not with all that we've gone through in our country in the last two years, right? And and Paul says this is the result of Adam's choice, that death spread to all people, which of course means both physical death and spiritual death. Uh, Physical death, G.K. Chesterton said this, he said, "Uh, original sin is the only doctrine that is empirically verifiable. In other words, Everybody dies. Death does not discriminate who it takes. Despite all of our technology, all of our uh, medicines, all of the uh, acai, all of the kale and blueberries we eat, the death rate is still one to one. The undertaker is batting a thousand. Death and disease affect everyone. Nice people, cruel people, smart people, ignorant people, Rich people, poor people, innocent infants, and guilty adults. But it's also spiritual. It also means spiritual death. Spiritual death means that we were all born into a posture of rebellion against God. With like a a fist just, just clenched at the heavens. Just assuming that our way is better. And that our desires are more important. Right? And And here's the thing. I'm a, I'm a dad. You got three kids. Every parent knows this. Like my kids came out of the, the womb. I've said this before. Like um, 
the, the, the seagulls from Nemo. Remember that? Remember, remember what those, everybody watch Nemo, please? Get, what? Mine, 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 mine. That's my kids. My kids came out of the womb that way. Who taught them that? No one. No one had to teach them that. Like we never had to send our kids to sin camp. Like we didn't have to get them online to watch some selfishness seminars. Like they came by that instinctively. Why? Because they inherited it. That's what Paul's saying. You are a sinner because you inherited it. So even if you don't understand the logic of original sin, you can at least see the effects of it. Like how else can you explain the pervasive wickedness in our world? Why do we as a race, despite all of our education, all of our improvements, all of our advances, still have such trouble just doing what is right, even when we know it's wrong or bad for us? Why do riches almost always lead to selfishness? Why does power almost always lead to corruption? Why are we attracted to so much wrong? I'll give you a theory. And this is actually an, an alternate theory as to where selfishness comes from. Uh, it's posed by atheistic evolution. Basically, their theory says that selfishness is bred into us through the principle of survival of the fittest. So selfishness helped our species, our family line, survive in harsh, troublesome, competitive environments. The, the reason that our our species, our family, your family, the reason that we're here we, is because we figured out a way to kind of claw and crawl our way to the top, and that didn't happen by being kind and selfless. Now, according to this theory, there's no such thing as wrong, because wrong implies, well, that there's like a referee who has to establish the rules. There's only useful or harmful for the propagation of our species. Now, I will say this, in recent, in recent years, certain evolutionists like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, uh, kind of realizing kind of our moral bankruptcy of this worldview, have said, well, now that we're in this advanced state, we see that kindness and love can actually help humans survive in community, so we should choose that. But here's the thing, even in that, They're not saying that love is inherently good, just that it appears to be useful for our species. Whereas before, it was cruelty and dominance were useful. And according to the internal logic of this series, of of this theory, uh, selfishness and exploitation and abuse are not wrong or evil per se, because there is no wrong or evil. They're just simply not useful. So, if you're not a Christian, if, if you're an agnostic, you have to consider this because this is a, a really, really big deal, especially when it comes to something like justice. You see, if all we are is just accidental biology and chemistry thrown together, you can't cry injustice. You can't. You have no grounds for it. You can only argue in terms of usefulness, not right and wrong, because in order for something to be wrong, there has to be a higher standard to appeal to. So there are basically two options. The atheistic option, which says that there's no such thing as good and evil, there's just useful, which makes justice impossible. Or the other option, which is the Christian option, which says that we were created for good, so we know what justice is, but every single person is just horribly bent towards evil. So which are you going to choose? Now, you say, if, if I only get two options, this has got to be the most depressing sermon ever. Yeah, there's a lot of bad news today. But it, it gets better. It gets better. But Paul has one more insight. So Paul says, number one, that we're born into sin. Number two, that sin leads to death. If you got it, say, I got it. Then the third thing that Paul says and wants us to know is this, is that sin divides the world into two. Look at verse 13. He says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. 
Yet death reigned from Adam, all the way from the beginning, to Moses before the law, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Underline this. Who was a type of the one who was to come. Here, here's what Paul wants us to know. That Adam is a type of the one to come. That there are some commonalities between Adam and Jesus. And the main commonality is this, that one man impacts a whole bunch of people. Adam's one sin infected and affected everybody, and Jesus' one act of righteousness on the cross infects and affects a whole bunch of people. And what he is talking about here is, in this world, there are only two teams. There is Team Adam and Team Jesus. That's it. You are either a son of Adam, born into your own sinfulness, or you are a son of God adopted into his kingdom. That's what he's talking about. Once again, Adam's sin has led to everyone else's sin. Every single one of us is born a sinner. And in this world, there's only two teams. It is either Team Adam or Team Jesus. In the gospel, it's like a big eternal game of Red Rover, Red Rover. Remember Red Rover? Anybody ever play Red Rover as a kid? Like, like three of you. It was, uh, in, it, it was incredibly dangerous. I'll explain it. Uh, I honestly don't know how any of us are still alive or have all of our teeth. But here, here's the game. of Red. So there's two teams, okay? They're facing each other, and uh, you're there. Your team's holding each other's hand. The other team is doing the same thing. They're holding each other's hand. And what you would do, this is how we would do it when I was a youth pastor, uh, we would lock up arms, and basically your job was to call out a person's name from the other team. And so you would pick, I don't know, uh, one of the wimpiest kids on the other side because they're going to run across to your side, try to break your, arm, your arms, your bond together, your hands just clap. They're trying to break it through, and so you obviously want the wimpiest kid. And so, like, I don't know, the kid with, like, a, like an ankle bracelet and, like, an inhaler, like, and his name's Eddie. Um, and so you're, you're, if your name's Eddie, I'm sorry. Um, so you're going to call Eddie over, and Eddie's going to come running over with everything he's got, and he's going to hit those arms, and he's either going to break it through, and if he doesn't break it through, what happens is you get to keep Eddie. And so that's just the game. You just keep calling the Eddies, right? You just, and you just try to build up your team and take everyone out that's on the other team. No. Here's the thing. The gospel is that God calls out to every single one of us to come over. The gospel is that Jesus wants you on his team. That's the call. You've heard it. And he will never, ever, ever let you go. He'll never, ever let you go. And when you come running at him with all of your mess and all of your baggage, he never, ever, ever regrets calling your name. That's what he's saying here. You're either a son of Adam or a son of the most high God. And then Paul spends the next few verses just contrasting these two teams. Look at verse 15. He says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So the similarity is one man, Adam, sin, affects and affects everyone. One man, Jesus, infects and affects a ton of people. But there are differences here. Here's three. Team Adam, we earned the trespass. Team Jesus, we didn't earn the free gift. Number two, Team Adam, we participate in the trespass. We are active participants in the rejection of God. We either reject him by flat-out rebellion, I'll do whatever I want, when I want, with whom I want, like eating the apple, or we reject him through religion. We make up our own rules to follow them and say, God, get out of my face, I'm good, I'll make up my own rules. But we are active participants in the trespass. But team Jesus, we are passive, and we receive the free gift that is given to us. You see, the, the gospel is something that is received, not achieved. And then number three, Team Adam, the trespass affects everyone. Team Jesus, the free gift only applies to those who receive the cure. See, it's, it's like we have a hereditary disease that, that we are born with, and Jesus is that 
here. So Paul says, you need to know this. This is why sin is such a big deal. You need to know that you were born into it. It will lead to death, and sin has divided the world into two. And that's the bad news. But that's not all, thankfully. Paul ends with some really good news. He says, verse 16, And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. In other words, that free gift of grace is greater than any trespass you've ever committed. That that one sin by Adam led to billions of other sins. And yet that one event at the cross where Jesus said, it is finished, led to the forgiveness of any sin that has ever been committed to the person that would just receive the gift of his grace. In other words, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, write this down. That God's grace is greater than your sin. And, and I'm telling you, in over a decade of ministry, I've talked to a lot of people who would come up to me after services or in coffee shops and say, Bryson, even me? Especially you. But then they're like, oh, Bryson, you have no idea what I've done. I'm like, the way you're saying it, I don't know if I want to know what you've done. I don't have to know what you've done. All I need to know is what he's done. And that his blood that was spilled on the cross is infinitely greater than your sin. That's what he's talking about. And here's the thing. He, he doesn't just give you a little bit of grace. Like just kind of, just enough grace to kind of get in. No, he, he, he pours it out on you. Look at verse 17. This is so good. He says in verse 17, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who received the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Notice the word abundance. Do you know how much abundance is? It's more than you need. It's more than you need. That's how much it is. It is more, how much you need? I need a lot. It's more than that. And this is a big deal. This is a huge deal because one of the questions that I get often about sin, especially people that struggle with the same sin as, as man, Bryce and I blew it again. I'm like, yeah, I know you did. But how could God ever love me again? How could God ever use me again? Ever been there? You see, I think that we think that God has run out of grace. And Paul says, oh no, there's more. There is more than you need. And and you know what makes this a really big deal? This actually makes repentance easier and quicker. But if you think that God is like a dad standing at the door holding his belt, are you coming home soon? No. No. A lot of people think that God is like a Zeus-type figure just holding a lightning bolt, just waiting for you to mess up. Let me just tell you something. Even if that was your imagery or your way of thinking, let me tell you, God took the bag of bolts away in Jesus. Jesus took every one of them. There is no more. So God is not at the door checking his watch with a belt in his hand waiting for you to come home to punish you. In fact, there's a story in the Bible called the prodigal son. It's a very familiar story. It's about God's unconditional love. And there's a dad and he's got two sons and one of the sons, the younger son, I don't know why it's always the younger one, just rebels and leaves home and he just blows up his life. He blows his inheritance And he comes to the end of himself. He's in the middle of the mud. I imagine him face down, just what am I doing with my life? I've 
just wrecked my life. I'm no good. No one wants me anymore because I've, my dad doesn't want me. He just gets up and he thinks, you know what? Maybe. I've got an idea. I need to go home. Maybe my dad will take me on as his slave. And so he, what does he do? He heads home. And on the way home, he's kind of writing out his, his sorry speech, his apology, his remorse. He's writing it out. He's practicing. He's rehearsing it. And he's walking along the road. And the story, as the story goes, the, the father sees him from a long way off. It's almost like he's been just watching down the long dirt road every day, just waiting at the door for his son to come home. He's been watching and watching and waiting. And he sees his son. You know what he does? He runs. He sees his son, and he takes off, which was not something that you would do in a Jewish culture normally. So he's breaking all the rules of customs and traditions to come get his son. And the Bible says when they meet, it says the father opens up his arms wide and he just wraps up his boy. He welcomes him home and then he just starts to lavish him with his love. He says, you're not going to be my slave. You're my son. Welcome home. And in the same way, when Jesus got on the cross and his hands were nailed, wide to the cross. It is God saying, I love you this much. My arms are open wide and you are forever welcomed in my presence. Friends, that is abundance. That is abundance. So Paul says, yeah, sin's a big deal because it will kill you. But God's grace is greater than your sin, and his son will heal you. Now, one of the things that we do every week as a preaching team, uh, me and a couple guys get together, and uh, we kind of unpack each text that we're going to preach out of, each sermon that we do. And uh, one of the things that we do is we just kind of summarize what, what we want you to know, what we want our people to know when they walk out of, um, out of this room. And uh, this week, all I wrote down was five words. Sin kills, but Jesus heals. Sin kills. Friends, sin will put you into the grave. It will put everything about you into the grave. It will put your relationships into the grave. Put your hope into the grave, happiness into the grave, joy into the grave. It will beauty into the grave. Sin kills, but Jesus heals. He can revive you. He can restore you. He can heal you. He can heal and restore every part of your life that sin has destroyed. So why is sin a big deal? Because it kills. It kills. It kills you. But why is Jesus a big deal? Because he is the only one that can heal you. So as we leave today, let me just leave you with one question. Which team are you on? Team Adam? Or Team Jesus? If you'd say, I'm on Team Adam today and I know it, all I want you to know today is I want you to know that Jesus will have you. And Jesus will heal you. Today, right now, you can make that decision. And for those of you that are on Team Jesus, let me just ask you, who are you calling out to? Who are you calling over from the other side? Who are you inviting into this glorious truth? I mean, how could we not? Knowing what we know, do all that we can to see as many as we can be healed by Jesus. 
So which team are you on? There is a response called today for each one of us. If you're on team Adam, Jesus will have you. Come on over. If you are on team Jesus, who are you inviting next week? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your abundant grace that you have poured out onto all of us. Thank you for making your grace available as a free gift that we don't have to earn. And today, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that someone in the room would accept it. They would move from Team Adam to Team Jesus, and those on Team Jesus would go get their friends that are on Team Adam. God, would you use us? God, we've got the greatest hope in the world, and it's inside of us that know you. Thank you for this word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.